Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining in today. Today, I'm going to be going over a Court of Appeal decision in Florida. It's not in the Markell case, but it is in the case of Denise Williams. She was convicted of having a hand in murdering her husband, Mike Williams, many years ago. And for 17 years, this was a complete mystery as to how Mike Williams died. So first, I'd like to show you guys um, sort of a more recent article from Tallahassee Democrat about this case. A lot of people who are tuning in probably already know about this case, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time delving into the details. Of course, it's also rehashed in the actual court opinion. So this is from September 2021, when Denise was resentenced to 30 years for conspiracy. But the Court of Appeals actually overturned her murder conviction for reasons we will get into later. This is a picture of the back of her with her attorney when she's pleading with the judge at her resentencing hearing in Leon County. And that's another picture of Denise Williams. Okay, so I'll just take that off the screen so people can get a visual of this. Um, thank you guys for being here and for your interest in this case also. And later on, we will also touch on a little bit about the Markell case and how this might have some sort of bearing on the um, prosecution of the Adelsons. So let me get the court decision on the screen here. Thank you all for tuning in on a Saturday afternoon. So got my tea here, need to take another sip. All right, so hopefully you guys can see this on the screen. I'm gonna try to make it look a little bigger. This was issued November 25th, 2020 on appeal from the circuit court for Leon County, which is the same place where the Markell case is taking place. And here we go. Okay, so Denise Williams appeals her convictions for first degree murder and conspiracy to commit murder arising from the death of her husband, Mike Williams. She raises multiple grounds for reversal of her convictions, and she also challenges her sentence. We write to address three of her arguments. One, the trial court erred in denying her motion for judgment of acquittal on the charge of principal to first degree murder. Two, the trial court erred in denying her motion for judgment of acquittal on the charge of conspiracy to commit murder. And three, the trial court erred in denying her motion to compel the state to elect between two mutually exclusive charges. Because we agree that the evidence presented at trial could not support her conviction for first degree murder as a principal, we, we reverse that conviction, finding no merit in her other arguments on appeal. We affirm her conviction and 30 year sentence for conspiracy to commit murder. Okay, so there are many pages about the background on the case and I'll try to touch on most of them. Okay, one, facts. In the early morning hours of December 16th, 2000, Brian Winchester and Mike Williams met to go duck hunting at Lake Seminole, like they had so many times before. Only this time, Mike, Brian planned to murder Mike. Brian and Mike, along with their respective spouses, Kathy Winchester and Denise Williams, were lifelong friends that often socialized with each other. In 1997, Brian's and Denise's friendship evolved into a love affair, and they began to see each other regularly. As their relationship continued, they wanted to spend more time with each other, but Denise refused to divorce Mike for fear of having to share custody of their child. Instead, according to the state's theory of the case, Brian and Denise hatched a plan to kill Mike. This would allow them to be together and collect on Mike's life insurance policy. Brian was the only witness who directly connected Denise to Mike's murder. He explained that he and Denise started thinking of ways to be together about a year to a year and a half before Mike's murder. 
Brand described their planning as, quote, very mutual, unquote. But he also admitted that he, quote, instigated a lot of it, unquote. They rejected several plans, including staging a robbery of Mike's office before deciding to make Mike's death look like a hunting accident. Brian explained that he planned to fake an accident in which both Mike and he would fall into the water. But he would be on the idea because Mike's survival would then be up to God and she could feel better about herself if it were more like an accident and less like a murder. For their plan to work, the trip had to occur during duck hunting season and before one of Mike's life insurance policies lapsed. Denise also wanted the duck hunting trip to happen soon so she would not have to go on an anniversary trip with Mike. Okay, so just um, scrolling down through here. Um, so this gives you the background of the whole thing where um, ultimately Brian was the one who took Mike on the fishing trip. They drove separately and he first pushed Mike into the water and was hoping that Mike would drown because he was wearing his waders. But um, Mike somehow got onto <laughs> maybe some some old pieces of wood or tree trunks or something in the water. So he's wondering like, why did you just shove me into the water? So Brian pulled out his uh, rifle and shot him in the head. I think either, yeah, it's twice. It says Brian circled the boat around Mike twice before shooting Mike in the head and killing him. Brian loaded Mike's body into his truck, drove home, returned to bed, with his wife to establish an alibi and later drove to a secluded area near his home to bury Mike's body. Brian testified that he did all of this on his own. Denise was not there for any of it and she was not on the phone with Brian while he murdered Mike or disposed of the body. Brian later would join the search party trying to locate Mike. Authorities found Mike's truck and boat trailer at the Lake Seminole boat launch. They also found his boat on the shore nearby. A few weeks after he went missing, searchers found Mike's waders and jacket in the lake. Various search and rescue teams continued to search Lake Seminole for Mike until at least February 2001. While the search for Mike continued, and 19 days after Mike's disappearance, Denise filed claims for the life insurance money. In June 2001, she petitioned for Mike's death certificate, which she obtained in July 2001. When asked about Denise's participation in Mike's murder, Brian explained that, quote, Denise really didn't have, a, have to do a whole lot other than come up with an alibi for herself and make sure that Mike went. After the murder, Brian and Denise had limited contact with each other to avoid arousing suspicion. Okay, so this talks about Mike's mother, Cheryl, who was instrumental in making sure that her son got justice. She suspected Denise pretty soon after her son disappeared, and she often would stand outside on the street with signs trying to draw attention to her son's disappearance. Okay, so later Denise didn't allow Mike's mother to see the granddaughter. Um, Brian and Denise got married uh, after Brian divorced his wife. Okay, so later on, their marriage went sour too. So this is about 17 years after Mike went missing and was presumed dead. And people thought, oh, well, maybe he just drowned or he got eaten by alligators because no one found his body. Um, but ultimately, Brian and Denise had a big falling out. She wanted to get divorced. And um, there was a situation where Brian ended up kidnapping Denise and possibly pointing a gun at her, or sticking a gun in her side. So she ran off to the police. But Brian was the one that ended up cutting a deal with the prosecution. So he only got 20 years in prison. Um, so that's what it says here. Brian was sentenced to 20 years imprisonment, followed by 15 years probation for the kidnapping. And he agreed to testify against Denise. Um, also, Brian 
as part of the deal, he did lead the investigators to where Mike's body was buried. Okay, so I'm just gonna kind of scroll down a little bit here. This has to do with defining first degree murder in Florida. And let me get something to drink. I'm sorry, my voice is just failing as usual, so. By statute, a person who commits any criminal offense against a state and one who aids, abets, counsels, hires, or otherwise procures such offense to be committed, and such offense is committed or is attempted to be committed, are both subject to the same charge, conviction, and punishment for the offense as a principle in the first degree. This is based on Florida law. Denise argues that there was not enough evidence to support her conviction as a principle to first degree murder. She asserts that we should interpret the statute as requiring proof of one, an intent to commit the crime, number two, the commission of a physical act in furtherance of that intent. She contends that communication alone cannot support a conviction as a principle. To address this argument, we must examine what conduct this principle statute criminalizes. And to do that, we look to the original meaning of the statutory terms, which predate statehood by 100 years or more. Okay, so talking about the history of this type of law, um, we'll just skip over to this. Okay. Comparatively, a principle in the second degree historically was one removed from the absolute perpetrator. This one was actually or constructively at the scene of the crime and aided or abetted in its commission. By definition, then, the key components of a second degree principle were presence and contemporaneity. That is, this principle would be with the primary perpetrator in real time, actively assisting, directing, or encouraging the primary perpetrator as the crime is being committed. Presence did not have to be an actual immediate standing by within sight or hearing of the fact, but there could also be a constructive presence as when one commits a robbery or murder and another keeps watch or guard at some convenient distance, citing to Blackstone, which is a legal treatise and uh, Florida case holding that a driver who waited outside during a fatal robbery and then drove his cohorts away as planned was a principal to the crimes. Still, if a person were not present, either actually or constructively, then he would be an accessory, not a principal. Okay, Blackstone noting that absence is necessary for someone to be an accessory because otherwise presence would make the person a principal. Of course, a person just standing by at the scene of an ongoing crime would not necessarily have been a principal. To be criminally culpable, the person also had to have actively participated in the offense at the time it occurred by working together with the absolute perpetrator. That is, there must be contemporaneity. Blackstone <coughs> explaining that the second degree principle is present, aiding and abetting the fact to be done. A principal in the second degree is one who aids in the commission of a felony by being present, aiding and abetting the commission of the felony at the time it is perpetrated. Okay, citing Riles versus State, an old Florida case that said, uh, that noted the rule in Florida is that a second degree principal must not only be present aiding or abetting the killing by the actual perpetrator, but must also be a participant in the felonious design with which the killing is done. Uh, citing also Staten explaining that to be guilty as a principal for a crime physically committed by another, one must intend that the crime be committed and do some act to assist the other person in actually committing the crime. So uh, let's just jump forward here. Okay, so they're citing a lot to this Blackstone treatise. Blackstone went on to illustrate what was meant by terms like these as follows. If A then advises B to kill another, and B does it in the absence of A. Now B is principal and A is accessory in the murder. 
referring to an accessory for the fact as one who commands or counsels another to commit an unlawful act. Historically, then, for a person to be culpable as an accessory before the fact that is absent from the crime and not actively participating at the time the crime was committed, he would have had to have done more than simply provide some assistance in advance. Okay, so then they're talking more about the history of the laws. Um, I think it was page 12 where, uh, where I thought it was really important here. Of course, the whole decision is important. Okay, so here they're <coughs> bringing up Garzon versus State, which is a 2008 Florida decision. There, the defendant directed the commission of a home invasion robbery through a 39-minute cell phone conversation. The Supreme Court determined that a principal instruction properly was given, despite the defendant not being physically present at the home invasion, because the evidence pointed to the defendant being the one with whom the perpetrators were speaking via cell phone during the home invasion. Emphasis applied. With all of this in mind, Denise's focus on distinguishing between acts and words is misplaced. Words, of course, can be used to encourage, incite, procure, and even assist. Okay, citing to a very old 1784 case. Many actions that could fall within the terms of the statute, including abetting, counseling, hiring, and procuring, may be accomplished through words alone. We again look to Garzon, where the Supreme Court explained that, quote, if the law of principles applied, the jury could in fact convict Garzon based on the other perpetrator's actions, provided Garzon had a conscious intent that the criminal acts be done and that Garzon did or said something to aid or encourage those acts. Emphasis supplied. This court has also previously held that a principal conviction may rest on some act or word which was intended to and which did incite, cause, encourage, assist, or advise the other person or persons to actually commit or attempt to commit the crime. For these reasons, we reject the principle. We reject the argument that a defendant may not be found guilty as a principal based solely on communications. Still, Denise is correct that the state failed to produce competent, substantial evidence to prove that she was a principal to murder under the statute. Her only ostensibly culpable conduct, e.g. consideration of ways to kill Mike, development of an alibi, agreeing to encourage Mike to go hunting with Brian, did not constitute commanding or impelling Brian to commit the murder, the equivalent of accessory before the fact, or the assisting of, and or the assisting or encouraging of Brian at the time he actually was committing the offense, the equivalent of second degree principle. There was nothing presented at trial that could meet the meaning of any of the terms in section 777.011 Florida statutes. For instance, missing at trial was any evidence that Denise counseled, hired, or procured Brian to murder Mike as those terms originally were understood to mean. This is to say, <clears throat> no evidence showed that Denise was initiating, instigating, promoting, driving, or encouraging force behind the murder, like an accessory before the fact would have had to have been. Affirming defendant's conviction, okay, so they're citing to another case from 1988, affirming defendant's conviction as a principal to first degree murder, even though she was not present during the commission of the crime when she was the one that concocted a plan to commit a burglary. And also citing to Ehrlich, another case affirming defendant's convictions as a principal to two counts of second degree murder and two counts of attempted second degree murder even though she was not present during the commission of the crimes when she was the one that passed along the instruction to kill the victim. While Brian characterized the planning of the murder as, quote, very mutual, he also stated that he, quote, planned a lot of it and that he instigated a lot of it. Brian never testified about anything Denise did or said to incite her encourage him to commit the murder. Brian's testimony showed that Denise mostly agreed with the idea of killing Mike. As will be discussed further below, that evidence is relevant to the conspiracy charge. 
it does not prove that Denise was the prime mover behind the murder. Notably, Denise at one point was getting cold feet about the idea, and Brian had to encourage her to be on board before he would move forward. Also missing at trial was any evidence that Denise aided or abetted Brian in the actual commission of Mike's murder, as those terms originally were understood to mean. That is, there was nothing that showed that Denise had acted as the equivalent to the old principal in the second degree by assisting or goading Brian at the time he was murdering Mike. In fact, when asked about the steps taken before Mike's death, Brian explained that, quote, Denise really didn't have, a, have to do a whole lot other than come up with an alibi for herself and make sure that Mike went. Neither action, though, was, quote, some act to assist Brian in actually committing the crime. Even though Section 777.011 makes Denise's presence at the scene of the offense irrelevant, for her to have aided or abetted Brian under the statute, there still needed to be evidence that she assisted him in real time while the murder was occurring. There was no testimony that Denise was present at the lake while the murder happened, nor any testimony that Denise was on the phone with Brian while he was at the lake with Mike, encouraging him to go through with it or giving him advice or guidance on how to pull the murder off when things were not going as they originally had planned. Okay, the state contends for the first time on appeal that Denise is secretly paying the premium on Mike's insurance policy was enough to support the conviction. We reject that contention. Denise's act of maintaining Mike's insurance policy did not entice or encourage Brian to commit the crime. There was no promise to Brian that he would get the proceeds if he murdered Brian. Of course, the insurance policy premiums could not have facilitated the murder itself. It is true that under the principal statute, no distinction is made between those who are the brains of the crime and those who are the arms of the crime. But the evidence presented by the state shows that Brian was both. It was Brian who initiated the plan to murder Mike, who did most of the planning and who did all of the work. And it was Brian who kept moving forward even as Denise got cold, cold feet. Okay. Let's take a look here. Is anybody tuning in? Oh, I'm always surprised to see how many people show up in the, in the live stream show. So thank you guys all being here. Yeah, so as we're reading all these words and how the law applied to the Williams case that allowed Denise Williams to, to um, get away with murder or, you know, had her conviction overturned, let's think of, you know, how this might apply to people like Charlie and Wendy Adelson or Donna. Adelson or even Harvey, you know. So um, let's see. I guess I'll pick out some more important details. I feel like a lot of this stuff is important details, but it's just so hard to keep reading when my throat is gone. So our review of the record unearths no evidence of conduct by Denise, either that incited, instigated, or encouraged the murder of Mike or that assisted or encouraged Brian at the time that he actually murdered Mike. Because Denise did not do or say anything to abet Brian in the murder of Mike, as those terms originally were understood to mean, and she did not counsel, hire, or procure Mike's murder beforehand, i.e. she did not get the ball rolling, we reverse her conviction as a principle to first-degree murder. Okay, number two, conspiracy to commit murder. Denise next contends that evidence cannot sustain her conviction for conspiracy to commit murder. Because the evidence shows that Denise and Brian had an agreement to kill Mike and that Denise intended for Brian to kill Mike, we disagree. Quote, a conspiracy exists where there is an express or implied agreement between two or more persons to commit a criminal offense and an intention to commit the offense. The fact finder may infer the agreement from the circumstances. Direct proof is not necessary. So that I find pretty important. Direct proof is not necessary because sometimes in the comments to all of these, you know, Katie McDaniel trial and Dan Morkel videos, a lot of people 
or not a lot, but there's always a few people who keep claiming that, well, there's no evidence of this, that Katie did this, or no evidence that Wendy did this. So let's say that again. The fact finder may infer the agreement from the circumstances. Direct proof is not necessary. Okay, and they're citing a couple of cases or several cases from Florida explaining that because conspiracy may be proven by circumstantial evidence, the jury may infer that an agreement existed to commit a crime from all the surrounding and accompanying circumstances. A defendant may be guilty of conspiracy even if she, quote, played only a minor role in the total operation. And this is a quote from Moran, uh, quoting another case, Cummings versus State, um, 1987 Florida appeal case. At bottom, the essence of conspiracy is the agreement to engage in concerted unlawful activity. Okay, they're citing some other circuit cases, including U.S. versus Cole, explaining that there must be an agreement or common purpose to violate the law for there to be a conspiracy, emphasis supplied. The real evil at the heart of a criminal conspiracy, shown by the preceding highlighted terms, is the agreement itself, which remains the essential element of the crime. Okay, so citing some more cases here. There was ample evidence through Brian's testimony that there was an agreement between him and Denise to accomplish the murder of Mike and that Denise intended for the murder to occur. Brian's testimony supported the existence of an agreement. It showed that they discussed alternative methods of killing Mike and Denise squashed plans that she thought were too risky. Brian testified that they decided to go with the hunting accident plan because it assuaged Denise's conscience. Brian testified that Denise was not there with him at the time of the murder, but she, quote, was in my head behind me, unquote. After Denise got cold feet and called off the first planned hunting trip, Brian met with her to see if she still wanted to go through with the murder. He did not want to stage the accident if Denise was, quote, wishy-washy. <coughs> Denise again agreed that they should proceed. There could be no doubt that, at a minimum, the multiple meetings between Brian and Denise to discuss plans for the murder made it more likely that the murder actually would occur. This increased likelihood is precisely the public danger that conspiracy statutes seek to mitigate. Joint action is generally more dangerous than individual action. Okay, so that's a quote from a different circuit's uh, case. Simply put, when it comes to crime, there is public danger in numbers. The third district observed as follows. As with most conspiracies, the very agreement to work together to kill the victim provided the co-conspirators with an increase in manpower, an increase in the capacity to plan, and an increase in resources. In theory, this group dynamic astronomically raised the chances that their objective would be attained, parentheses, the victim would be killed, end parents. No one would back out of the plan, and if someone did back out, he would be replaced. Okay, citing Calderon versus State, a Florida case from 2011. There was also evidence that Denise intended for the murder actually to happen when she entered the agreement with Brian. Brian testified that it was Denise's job to make sure that Mike went on the fateful hunting trip. Although that testimony was insufficient evidence to show that Denise committed an act that assisted Brian in actually murdering Mike at the time it happened, and support her conviction as a principal, it was certainly enough to establish Denise's intent to engage in, quote, concerted criminal activity to support a conviction for conspiracy. Her payment of the extra insurance premium to extend Mike's life insurance policy, her agreement to come up with an alibi, and her preference for one plan over another all circumstantially showed her intent to participate in a conspiracy and see that its objective was accomplished. Additionally, 
Denise's actions after Mike's murder provided additional accompanying circumstances from which the jury could infer her involvement in the conspiracy. She tried to use the promise of visitation with her daughter as an incentive to stop Cheryl's campaign to reopen the criminal investigation into Mike's disappearance. And after, Mike, after Brian's arrest, Denise conveyed a message to Brian's father that she was, quote, not talking, unquote. Because there was ample evidence of an agreement between Denise and Brian to kill Mike, we affirmed Denise's conviction for conspiracy to commit murder. Okay, so this uh, other stuff, I don't think it really relates that much to the Markel Adelson case, so I'll skip over it. Okay, so conclusion, we conclude that although the evidence was sufficient to sustain Denise's conviction for conspiracy to commit murder, the evidence was insufficient to show that Denise met the criteria under the statute for being convicted and punished as a principle to Mike's murder. We also hold that any error caused by denying the state's motion to compel election was harmless. We reject Denise's other claims raised on appeal without further discussion. As a result, we reverse Denise's conviction and sentence for first degree murder, but affirm her conviction and sentence for conspiracy to commit murder. Okay, so um, very interesting court decision because when you just kind of skim the headlines, it's like, oh my gosh, they overturned her conviction, but she's still gonna be in prison for a total of 30 years. So, you know, if she does get out, she will be what in her 70s or maybe even late 70s if she does get out after 30 years. And I think just reviewing uh, the, the law and the case citations here, it does um, give us more information about how things might pan out with the potential prosecution of the different Adelsons. So let me um, bring this back up here. Okay, so let me first take a look at the comments here because I can't believe so many people are interested in this on a Saturday afternoon. I always like do these live streams thinking, well, maybe like 20 or 30 people will be interested, but um, it's really cool to see so many people care about these different um, cases, not just the Williams case, but also the Markell case, the Robert Wan case, other other cases that I sometimes cover on this channel. Okay. Okay, so starting from the top. Hi, Shelly. Katie turning on Charlie, perhaps the way Denise's new husband and Mike's best friend turned on her. Yeah. So this is where sometimes it is it makes you feel like it's not really that bad of a thing if it seems like so much time has been going on and nothing is happening in the case. You don't know how much the investigators and the prosecutors have really been working hard behind the scenes. It's just not in the media. And once time passes, then a lot of times these kind of screwed up deviant people wind up turning on each other or you know their relationships collapse and then hopefully there will be eventually some justice or somebody cracking somebody making a deal you know witnesses coming forward who previously were afraid or didn't want to um, come forward and talk to people so um yeah so it is pretty interesting in this case too in the williams case how you know for so many years like 17 or so years, Denise and Brian had seemingly gotten away with it and seemed to be having their, you know, having a happy marriage and stuff, which eventually fell apart too. So I think it's good evidence that the appeals court upheld the conspiracy charge. There was not a lot of evidence against her other than Winchester, who got an even better deal than Rivera. Yeah, it, it does seem pretty shocking that he's the one who not only shoved his friend out of the boat trying to drown him, but then, you know, pulled out the rifle and shot him um, over and over again in the head so that his so-called best friend from childhood would die and then he could marry his friend's wife. <laughs> okay, yeah, so you notice, yeah, yeah. This is a great dress. I wanna get my money's worth out of it. So I will just keep wearing it again and again. Yeah, okay. Yeah, thank you, Peach Pie. Thanks, Queen. 
Queen Olive. Okay, hi, Angela, thanks for being here. And Rita, Helen is always here also. Thank you so much for all your support. Um, Okay, curious how Denise is able to maintain her hair. She's over 50, but no, she does have gray hair because if you look back at that photograph, I, I noticed she, she has plenty of gray hair, you know, but who am I to, you know, it's not a criticism. It's just an observation. Yeah, in that picture from the Tallahassee Democrat from two years ago, she definitely had gray hair. Yeah. Um, thank you, Fancy Fiction. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Debbie, for uh, okay, so looks like, okay, poor Mike Wooden's mother listened to the mother's victim statement, heartbreaking, yeah, she she just really was like a one woman driving force, because um, based on the book that Stephen Epstein had written about the case, it's called Evil at Lake Seminole, it sounds like even the police or people behind the scenes were getting tired of her or they brushed her off for so many years so she had her own crusade making up her own signs and, and trying to continue drawing attention to her son's mysterious disappearance yeah yeah totally crazy story hi lj thank you for being here also my heart bleeds for mike's mother she never gave up on bringing this case to light and lost her granddaughter in the process yeah so it's sad that the granddaughter still believes her mother and um, as far as I know, still has no relationship with, with Mike's mother. 17 years, over two, wow, 2,000 letters to the governor. Oh, I didn't know that. She's amazing and resilient. Yes, and it's so great that Mike's mother lived to be able to see this day and to be able to go to court and give her statement. Yeah, her mom is fierce. I wonder if Tim Jansen thinks this person has charisma too. <laughs> yeah, which person? Denise? Well, he was he was representing Brian Winchester though, so I'm sure he didn't have any positive things to say publicly about Denise. Yeah, yes, very heartbreaking case. Tim thought the first attempt at Dan Horkel was a week or two before he likes details. It was almost six weeks. Yeah, that's right, Debbie. Yeah, there's so many details in the Markel case also. Definitely, Miss Cheryl was a hero. Okay, Cheryl, all about the gator. She never gave up. Yeah, because she, she thought that was ridiculous, the theory that her son was eaten by alligators because it wasn't even feeding season or whatever. I don't know much about alligators. Um, it didn't mean anything because the attorney, Chris, brought this up to have the murder charge dropped from the possible charges like Denise Williams and Judge Hankinson shut him down. Okay. Um, in my opinion, Jansen is wrong quite often. And in my opinion, you'll see that proved again during Charlie's trial too, when Katie successfully testified. Yeah, I, I have a feeling that Katie probably will testify. I mean, she could have some important information. I don't know. I mean, we're all just speculating as usual. Okay, never gave up. Never, never, never give up, right? At least for Cheryl, it, it worked. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks everybody for being here. Oh, Lounge Bar Crime is here. Yeah, I like your channel also. You guys be sure to tune in to Lounge Bar Crime's um, amazing YouTube channel too, where she also gives some opinions about the Markel case. Denise was so hard-faced, actually expecting to be part of the party to send Brian down and for her to go on her merry way. Yeah, I saw part of her interrogation video on Deep Dive True Crime. So it is kind of like interesting how her attitude was when she was in there because she thought the police were gonna be on her side. Yeah, so she must've been so shocked when it turned out she was the one that got arrested. Yeah. Hi, Ollie, thank you. Uh, Carl Steinbeck, criminal legal club. <laughs> okay, um, okay. Brian and Denise got away with it until Denise expected civility from the murderer. Yeah, that's right. He turned on her also. Yeah. Oh, yes, I, I heard about that, that she worked at FSU. Carl also makes too many errors about the facts in Markel, same with the other guy. Okay. Yeah, there are just so many details out there. So, um, 
Uh, actually, Surviving the Survivor did ask me to join the guys, <laughs> the, those male attorneys, to talk about the Mark Cow case, but I actually politely declined because I really feel like, you know, there are some some attorneys that really do a lot of criminal law that know more about um, the legal aspects of the Markel Adelson case than I do, you know, because I don't practice criminal law much less in Florida. So um, sometimes I also feel like when there are too many guests, then you don't really get as much good information from anybody because you know, some of the guests are, wind up just sitting around, not not saying anything or barely being able to say anything. So. Um, okay, forgot about working there. The mother of Williams was right when they said he might just be buried somewhere not eaten by gators. Yeah, that's right. He was, in fact, buried by his so-called good childhood friend. Okay, made all the correction. Yeah, there are just too many details in this case that it's hard for people to keep it straight, right? Brian was the means Denise got the insurance money. Best friend writes a policy. Poor guy hanging on that stump when his best friend shoots him. In the end, Denise received more years than Brian, right? Correct, because she got 30 years. He made a deal and got 20 years. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so people are disagreeing here. Okay. Uh, finally caught alive. Wendy and Donna need to be arrested. I just watched Dan's mother... Ruth Markell's interview. She's an extremely smart mother. It's so sad Miss Ruth Markell hasn't seen her. Um, I guess you mean the grandchildren. I think she did She did get to see them a couple of times, um, but very, very briefly. It's always a very controlled type of situation. And then one Zoom call last, last summer, I think. Yeah, it is pretty awful. Can't find any trials of Carl's online. Looks like he did a lot for the military. Okay. Uh, she found out gators don't eat that time of the year or mating, I think. I forget. Yeah, Denise got 30 years. Thank you, Doug. Mike Williams received waiter training from an expert when he was young. The expert testified that he made Mike practice repeatedly getting his waiters off in a swimming pool. Well, that's good. Yeah, but then, you know, Brian happened to have that gun handy also and then just shot him. He was going to kill him one way or the other. So, so horrible just imagining that. Uh, after he quickly got out of his waiters, he grabbed a tree trump only for tree stump only for his best friend to pull the boat around and shoot him in the face. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Okay. Brian looked genuinely remorseful at trial. His actions were heinous. Yes. Definitely. Okay. Oh, Dylan Thomas. Okay. Interesting. Dylan Thomas is the name of the murder suspect also in the Robert Wan case. Okay, this case is a lot of fun. Even though the murder happened a long time ago, I like how everything is slowly coming to a close over time. Yeah, we hope so, because there are still plenty of unsolved murder mysteries, a lot of crimes that go unpunished. So um, let's just hope we get true justice in the Markel case, too, because only some of the perpetrators have actually been put in prison. Yeah. Uh, Marsha says, I know it was actually sad to watch. It had worn on him. You could tell he, meaning Brian Winchester, the shooter, felt awful and just wanted to do the right thing to try to right his wrong. Okay, well, at least he showed some remorse there, right? And he was able to finally bring some closure to this and before, before Mike's mother passed away. Okay, so okay, he seemed tortured by it. However, his testimony was only a year or so since he kidnapped Denise. Ah, yeah, pretty screw screwed up. Okay, so it looks like people are arguing about Carl Steinbeck. Um, okay. Definitely Helen Denise appealed on the first degree and did receive a reduction, but still has to do 20 years. Double check me, but I think it went from 30 to 20 years. Oh, okay. I thought it was still 30 because that was the last article that I just, I mean, the most recent article that I found 
from a Tallahassee Democrat, but I showed that at the very beginning of the live stream, yeah, which said um, 30 years, unless it changed after that, I'm sorry. Yeah, okay. Um, okay, who's Matt Orchard? Is he, is he someone else that's also on YouTube or has a podcast? Okay, so Carrie is saying, I love Matt Orchard's take on this case. I keep hoping he will tackle the Dan Markell murder. Okay, Angela says, thank you. I'm glad she deserves life without parole. Okay, she deserves more. Brian received 20 for kidnapping Denise, but zero for Mike. Yeah, yeah, it was must have been a hard choice, but ultimately I, I think just knowing that Mike's mother finally heard the true story of what happened, that and was able, they were able to find the body and bury him. So Denise Williams is doing 10 years more time than the man who actually committed the crime. She obviously thought that her distance from the crime would protect her wrong. Yeah. Okay, hi Esther. Hi Letterman's girl and Shalom, thank you so much. Oh, okay, yeah, thank you, Don. As I was reading and my voice is all hoarse and stuff, I'm thinking, gosh, I, maybe I should have asked someone to help me read with this, but I didn't think that I would feel so lousy on a Saturday afternoon because at least I haven't been working all day. Um, I'm just hoping certain cer <laughs> certain folk are aware of this case outcome and shaking in their designer boots. Yeah, maybe you would think by now they are shaking and not feeling so haughty that they got away with it. Yeah, that's right, Don. Yeah, direct proof is a real rarity. Yeah, definitely people have said multiple times on live streams, like the different commenters and attorneys, that there are plenty of um, murder cases that are based on circumstantial evidence as opposed to direct evidence. She looked 80 at the appeal. All her blonde hair was dark, so her face looked older than my roller skates, but no key for Denise, okay? Yeah, I don't know. Did she look 80? I didn't think she looked 80, but she definitely didn't look as, you know, nice as she looked when she was in her police interview many years ago. Yeah, okay, thank you, Don. The Miami clan knew it was going to happen. They paid for it in cold, hard cash, yeah. And that's where... I'm still hoping that Katie was able to to give more information, like where did that cash actually come from? You know, what was Wendy's role in all of this? Did you talk to Harvey? What was Harvey's role, if any? So, um, okay. Everyone knew who was responsible, but it took tears, years and years for Mike's grieving mother to see justice done for her son, yeah. Direct proof is a rarity, so it's hard to find in every case I watch. And some jurors not only expect it, they won't convict without it. So frustrating. Yeah, it is frustrating because the jurors are supposed to also listen to the judge's instructions or the jury instructions and follow the law. So there's no law saying you have to have direct evidence in order to convict somebody. Yeah. I wonder if Katie and Denise hung out at the Lowell Correctional Center. They seem so much alike. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, I don't I don't know how many people are in that correctional center and do they all mingle or have some joint activities where people can really schmooze mm -hmm. and get to know each other. I don't know. Um, okay, the fact that the appeal court upheld the conspiracy is great news. Yeah, yeah, that, that seems, I mean, expected yeah so that's good to see wendy will do at least 30 years yeah but every every case is different right but you know based on this reading of the williams court of appeal decision i don't think they're going to be able to get wendy for for first degree murder but um you know it sounds like they they should have more than enough or i hope they have enough evidence for conspiracy charges um again some of it hinges on what information Katie can also offer too. So 
Um, that's why I don't like to make absolute statements about this is bound to happen or, you know, this person can be convicted or it's definitely going to be convicted or whatever. I mean, we, we just don't know. So uh, Don says, right, Angela and Ho's cases are circumstantial, but not all circumstantial evidence is created equally correct. Um, hi, Keith. Good comparison and scenarios. Scenarios, yeah, based on actual reference legal paths. Um, yes, and has circumstantial evidence is is allowed alone to convict, but often there is more, as I believe we'll see in these cases too. Yeah, I'm so optimistic about it. So sure about the likelihood of Harvey getting indicted or arrested for anything, but um, you know, still keeping hope alive for eventual arrests of, of Wendy and Donna also. Can you imagine having to try to kill him twice? Yeah, are you talking about the Williams case or the Markell case? Because in, in both situations, yeah, Markell, they, they tried two times to kill him. Yeah, Jansen has skills getting Brian Winchester such a good deal, yeah. Um, yeah. Jansen's client had, okay, and Tim Jansen is an attorney in Florida who has been showing up on Surviving the Survivor to talk about the Markell case a bit. So just in case people are out there wondering who's Tim, who's Jansen. Okay, Jansen's client had tremendous leverage because they needed him, which is Brian Winchester, to get the wife. It was an obvious trade. Okay, Miss Cheryl is sound, yeah, she's of sound mind and she is tough. That is so sad. <coughs> Mike's mother has met Ruth Markell, both were denied access to their grandkids. Yeah. Yeah, Mike's daughter believes Denise. Hi, Shelves. Dan Markell's family has had to wait nearly 10 years. It's so sad. I hope they will not have to wait much longer to see the boys. Yeah. Yeah, some, some people have said that, um, that they believe Dan and Wendy's youngest son is having his bar mitzvah on October 14th. So that was probably the reason why uh, Rashbaum was saying that he had some family thing or he had something going on October 14th. So the trial of Charlie Adelson will take place after that child's bar mitzvah. And um, I assume the Markel parents are not invited to that. Yeah, so it is kind of aggravating that the Adelson family gets to spend another summer with the children and spending more time um, with with Dan and Wendy's children while the Markells continue to just be shut out of the kids' lives and still have to wait and wait for this trial to finally happen, hopefully at the very end of October. Okay. I watched a trial, very moving testimonies. Does Epstein's book have anything worthwhile that isn't in the trial or on ML's channel? Yeah, um, I, I enjoyed the book. So, you know, I know a lot of people, you know, were very surprised and, and some people were quite disgusted with um, what the author Stephen Epstein said on my live stream show when we were discussing the Markell case and his book about it. Um, but in regard to Evil at Lake Seminole, which is the book about the Mike Williams case that he wrote, um, I can't remember all the small details, but I thought that it was it was a really well-written, really great crime book, Evil at Lake Seminole. And he spoke extensively with Mike Williams's mother. And it sounded like the mother was just thrilled out of her mind and so grateful that somebody cared. So when he contacted her, she was ready to just get on the phone and, and give him an earful and keep talking to him as much as she could and giving as much information as she could to help him write the book. Because, you know, for so many years, people had just, you know, just turned away from her. And, and you know, she was probably so frustrated out of her mind and, and who knows what other people were still supporting her in trying to get justice for her son. So... I mean, I do think that that book, Evil at Lake Seminole, was very well written, and you can probably get some copies of it off of Amazon or eBay or something. So um, I really enjoyed reading that book. 
Miss Cheryl used money from her daycare business to pay for a billboard to keep the case alive. Yeah, I remember seeing some comments somewhere from people who said that um, Cheryl Williams was actually their, um, their daycare or care provider when they were kids. So a lot of people knew her because of her daycare. And I do recall that Mike Williams's father had died. Maybe was it in a car accident or motorcycle accident or something when Mike was very young. And um, I think he did have a brother also. Yeah, so, so that's why they never mentioned Mike Williams's father because he had died a long time ago before Mike died. I think, I mean, somebody correct me if I'm wrong. It's been a long time since I... It's been a while since I read that book. Um, I pray Katie has a complete makeover for Charlie's trial, her last trial out that was depressing. Yeah, well, I mean, you could tell they were trying to make her seem all like like a librarian, you know, all with those fake glasses and the, and the lumpy looking braids and stuff and being all, yes, ma'am, no, sir, no, ma'am. Yeah, so uh, who knows what she's going to wear for Charlie's trial. That'll be interesting. Yeah. Oh, okay, interesting. There's a video of Denise's arrest at FSU. Okay, boy, I bet Cheryl Williams enjoyed watching that. Hi, catching everything. Yeah. Uh, alligators eat whatever it can, including people and dogs all year round. Oh, okay. Um, okay, the daughter, granddaughter is Ainsley. Yeah, Ainsley doesn't speak with her grandmother. Cheryl, I think is her name. That's right. Till this day, she never understood how much she was loved by her deceased father and grandma. Yeah. I guess that's all she knew was her mother raising her. Although, you know, she wasn't that little when Mike died. So you would think she would still have some memories of, of being with her grandmother, her paternal grandmother also. Yeah. Mike Williams was as great a guy like Danny. Oh, okay. Did you actually know him? Yeah, I mean, I, I have read complimentary things about him also, that nobody had any problems with him. Um, Judy, you would have great insight and info for the true crime survivor. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, because like I said, it, it's it's like if, if there is just way too many guests, then I just feel like I don't really have enough to contribute, especially since I don't practice in Florida. I don't practice criminal law. I'm just some you know, very nosy attorney who has done a lot of sleuthing and reading about different cases. So, um, yeah, but we'll, we'll see. I mean, sometimes <laughs> there are times like even on my channel where it's like, well, what can we do now? We have to wait so many months before Charlie Adelson's trial. So what are we going to come up with and talk about next? Yeah. Denise Williams got arrested in the middle of the day at her FSU job. Her interviews say a lot about her. Too sad, Ruth Markell's grandparent act couldn't help Mike Williams's mom. Yeah, because the, the granddaughter is now an adult now. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Chris Butler. Uh, yeah, they needed the leverage to find, find Mike's body. Yeah, hi, her brave Lily. Thank you for being here also. Oh yeah, you guys definitely, Oh, okay. I didn't know that she was interviewed there. Interesting. Okay. Well, I guess that's something else to do later today or tomorrow then. Thanks for letting us know. Go Georgia. Just watch Ruth on brainwashing children with John Steinbeck, Carl's brother worth watching. Okay. That's going to be really interesting to hear. Yeah. John Steinbeck um, has written at least one book about parental alienation. So I think that'll be great to hear whatever um, conversation he had with Dan Markell's mother. As previously mentioned in this chat, Carl Steinbeck just makes numerous errors in his 125 points. Carl's legal specialties are military and employment law, Florida criminal law. Not, yeah, I mean, he, he does, did not practice criminal law in Florida, but, um, you know, everybody has something to contribute, right? And I guess that's what the comment box is. So if you see errors, and what people say, including what I say, you know, if I made an error, I wouldn't mind if people politely told me, you know, hey, you, you misstated this fact, or this is what really happened, or this is something you got wrong. So, uh, let's see. Oh, thank you, Don. You sound fab, but if your throat is hurt, yeah, I just don't have the voice for broadcasting. It's just so hard to keep talking and talking nonstop while also thinking of what to say without sounding like a complete nut job. 
Yeah. Show us the beautiful dress. Oh, okay. Well, this dress, it actually does not fit me well. So I don't know. It's very ill-fitting because I'm so short. And this dress, I don't think it came in a petite size. So when I bought it, I was just happy to get right size. But since my torso is so short, it's kind of bunched up here at the waist. But you can see the design. Yeah, this like bric-a-brac thing. It's not just a straight line, but it's like wavy looking. So if you want to try to make your own Wendy Adelson dress, this is what it looks like. So you go out there to um, Michael's Arts and Crafts or something and buy your black bric-a-brac <laughs> and stitch it onto a gray shift dress. Yeah, so this is what the dress looks like. I'm sucking in my stomach here. <laughs> Okay, so have I shown off the dress enough in case you would like to make your own replica dress? Or uh, it looks like some people are selling the dress in different sizes on places like Poshmark and eBay still. So, okay, thank you for appreciating this dress. It, it did take me a while to find it, and I was so happy to find it at a reasonable price on eBay. So, okay. Um, okay. Carl has 27 years military criminal prosecution and defense. A former assistant DA is less than a former public defender certified. Okay. Well, you know, I mean, yeah, it's, it's kind of hard to compare different attorneys and stuff. I mean, clearly, if I want to hear good commentary about the case, I want someone who actually knows the facts of the case really well. Um, and that's where it's like, okay, you don't really have to even be a lawyer to know the facts of this case really well. I mean, look at Tony, who has been my co-host at times. Tony has watched both the trials in the Dan Markell murder case 15 times. So, so that's, that's just amazing. And of course, you know, Fancy Fiction is not an attorney. And she's listened to all the wiretaps multiple times. You know, she's created all these graphics and, and educational videos so people can really understand the case. So um, just having a law degree or even practicing criminal law. I mean, <laughs> I, I'm not going to bash other attorneys, but clearly there are some some criminal law attorneys that might not really, you know, may have lost their common sense, or or you wouldn't really want to rely on their expertise or advice. So anyway, everybody has something to contribute, though. So um, as long as it's not spreading misinformation, right? Okay, Denise H. a lot, Haggard, yeah, and we've seen that with Charlie also, and Katie, yeah, looking like a mess, um, looking really unhealthy now. When the bleach fades and the Botox and fillers dissipate, times are tough. Yeah, and I've also seen some videos or read about things where people who got fillers, a lot of times the fillers don't really get reabsorbed by the body. And so over time, the fillers start like making lumps in other parts of the person's face or just really looking all messed up after, after years. Yeah, I've seen some videos from dermatologists where they're talking about how they don't want to do certain types of fillers anymore because um, MRI screenings or something showed that that substance was still somewhere else in the person's face and making them look deformed. So. Okay, so that's just a side issue. Yeah, in case anybody's wondering, like, how, how is Wendy going to look if she winds up in jail and then she doesn't have access to all these cosmetic procedures, you know, <laughs> or Donna? Yeah, thank you, Go Georgia. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Have a coffee. <laughs> yeah, lemon tea. Yeah, coffee is too dehydrating. I deliberately didn't have coffee today because I knew it would probably make me even more hoarse than normal. Shocks me that a woman would expect a man who murders for her to go down quietly. Yep, that's right. Yeah, the next the next victim is going to be you. You know, like if you hang around with dogs, then you catch fleas, right? Okay. Just happy to state took a swig swing at Denise regardless. Sends a message to the community and gets justice even with no murder one. They should pay if a jury comes back and says so. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. See, um, so Denise probably had no idea. She had, she thought she had gotten away with it because she wasn't the one that shot Mike, right? She was nowhere near there. She wasn't there encouraging or abetting. Um, and then Mike 
I'm sorry, not Mike, Brian took it upon himself to, you know, drag the body out and bury it and stuff without Denise's help. So, you know, Denise thought she was scot-free, but lo and behold, you know, she's not, um, not above the law. Some women that murder seem to enjoy the publicity and fit right in at jail. I guess they don't have a soul. Yeah, so it, it seems sort of like that with Katie Meg Banuel when I saw that, um, was it fancy fiction or true lifestyles? Where they mentioned that in one of the, some jail record, Katie was acting like she was almost like a celebrity or something because she has a court trial coming up. So she couldn't have a, she was trying to say that she shouldn't get a roommate or something to that effect because she has a trial coming up and it's very important, you know, as if, as if it's some sort of like um, a debut or a time trial for murder. So something's a little sticky with my cursor here. Okay, similar evidence, Wendy and Denise, Wendy will do 30 years. Yeah, time will tell. I mean, first we need to have her arrested, indicted and arrested and then put on trial. Yeah, we, we will see. Uh, I loved when Denise's brother-in-law said to her during her interrogation, you and Deb, her sister, are the same age, but y'all don't look out. Oh, really? Okay, I, I didn't catch that, but um, that's kind of mean for him to say. He didn't really have to say that, but interesting. Oh, okay. Aqua contact. Yeah, were you the person who said that everybody should wear aqua contacts to, to the trial? Well, unfortunately, I have really, really bad vision, and I already wear prescription contacts. So, yeah, I don't, I don't think I want to, you know spend hundreds of dollars getting cosmetic contacts, but plus they would also have to be the right prescription too. Yeah, but that would be kind of funny. You know, actually Mentor Lawyer has some sort of short video where his eyes are blue. And this was from years ago, but I'm not sure if he really got blue contacts or maybe he used some sort of app to make his eyes look blue. Yeah, that would look kind of creepy for me to have blue eyes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, thank you, John, or Wesley John Holmes. It's been said Denise slash Brian's families used their influence to pressure police prosecutors from investigating. Do you see this in the Mark Kell case? Yeah, and that's that's what I'm not sure because it, it does seem like the Adelsons have tons of money and they do have friends in high places, but I thought that it was mostly limited to Broward County, you know, closer to where they live, but who knows? You know, after all, there was a wiretap where um, Donna, said something to Charlie about how, uh, you know, Wendy's judge has been talking to a judge in Tallahassee. So, um, yeah, so we, we have no idea, although people suspect that Willie Meggs was um, pulling the strings and trying to shield the Adelson family years ago. So, whereas with the Winchester family, I mean, they were all actually there in Tallahassee, right? So, so that I can totally see happening where you know, maybe a lot of people knew the Winchester family, weren't they all in insurance or something? So people that all grew up around there knew each other. Yeah, whereas at least the Adelsons are down in Southern Florida and maybe they don't have as much influence. I've just made the leap to Estee Lauder advanced night repair shop. Wow, $115, that's expensive. Okay, um, let's see. Wendy will probably walk. Knowledge of the crime won't convict her in Florida. Also, if there is anything law enforcement has on her, she will flip. She already did on day one she, when she implicated Charlie Adelson. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I like I said, I'm still still optimistic. You know, it, the whole case is not over, anywhere near from being over at this point, and I just can't wait to hear what Katie has to say. So, um, so not sure that okay you moved to oil okay never heard of this venter's daughter okay thanks for the information i think rash bomb needed the delay because its family is going to see tom jones in concert <laughs> yeah that would be funny yeah so no i will not do a musical parody of of uh sex bomb okay i'm staying much better on the williams case than the markel case he's clueless about wendy he thinks she didn't even know in advance yeah that that was a strange interview for sure yeah for sure 
Okay, it's okay because the time that Adelsons are spending with the boys will not equal the lifetime they will spend with the Markels. It's a fake life right now for them. Yeah. Um, let's see. The Adelsons are so very vindictive and influential. It's pure evil that the Markels have been shut out of their grandchildren's lives, especially for milestones such as bar mitzvahs. Yeah. Uh, okay. Federal CJI panel member. Okay, well, I guess I need to do some more sleuthing about his credentials. Yeah. Um, salt of the earth. Um, Carl has demonstrated and proven the background to have federal criminal trial judges assign him cases. Okay. The Denise case is actually old now because, um, let's see, her trial was back in 2018. She was... Um, then convicted of murder and conspiracy. And then the Court of Appeals decision came out in late 2020. And then she was resentenced in 2021. Yeah. So sorry, I wasn't covering it back in 2021 when it was hot news and stuff. But I, I still thought that it was good to bring out the Denise Williams case because there are some slight similarities to the Markel, uh, Dan Markel murder case. Yeah. Okay, factual, please like and share. Thank you, Carol. Alligators eat everything. <laughs> Alligators are why I'll never try. Yeah, did you hear? There was actually like a older lady that just got eaten by an alligator in Florida when she was walking her dog. So that was in the news about a week or so ago. Oh, how interesting. Thank you, Amanda. What she says, when my mom and her siblings were young, Miss Cheryl Woods, their school bus driver. Oh. Yeah, well, I hope she's doing okay and that she has other family or friends that are supporting her um, since she has no relationship with that with the granddaughter. Oh, yeah, people asked about this also, but I, I have no idea. Is Mike Williams' daughter really his biological daughter? I know that Denise cheated on him for three years before they got married. Yeah, that I am I have no idea. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, Let's see, I totally do DNA to be sure. Yeah, well, at this point, it seems like the his daughter just wants to get away from the limelight, right? So uh, let's see, did I hear that right? The Adelson trial is now delayed until the end of October, correct? The jury selection will start on October 23rd, and then um, they expect the testimony to start on October 30th. So someone mentioned that Charlie's birthday is October 27th. So he'll be in the middle of his um, his big spotlight trial when his birthday rolls around. That should be interesting too. See if his attorneys give him any special gift or, or cupcake or something for his birthday. Yeah, they're on the same team. Status conference hearing in August. That's correct, yeah. August 25th at nine in the morning. Yeah, it's hard talking on TV, YouTube. Yeah, that's right, fancy fiction. I mean, I have to hand it to you when you do your live streams, your voice sounds really strong the whole time, even all the way to the end. But to me, it's just like, oh my God, <laughs> you know, like why, why I do a live stream, man? My throat hurts already, <laughs> okay. Um, is that true? How'd you learn this? Yeah, I, I had seen somebody leave a comment on a YouTube video about that that maybe Ainsley wasn't really Mike's daughter. Yeah, I love it. Oh, okay, you're talking about the dress. I guess I'm really behind in the comments. Yeah, it is a really nice dress. Too bad it just doesn't fit me very well. Otherwise, I guess I could really wear it for work. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, fashion show, fashion show. Okay, well, I do have a surprise for you guys, but I'll, we'll probably do it in a few more weeks because like I said, I'm kind of grasping at straws as to what I should do for more videos and live streams in the future, especially since so many people are addicted to the Dan Markel case. Yeah, okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah, loan it to Katie to wear for Charlie's trial. Oh, okay, well, you know, not to be mean, but I don't think Katie could fit into this dress. <laughs> so maybe she could have fit into the dress like five years ago, but uh -huh. Okay, wouldn't that be hilarious if all the viewers in the trial would wear the same dress as Wendy? Yeah. I think even Remy said that he would get a dress. <laughs> Maybe he was just joking. <laughs> You're hilarious wearing Wendy's dress. Yeah. I ate alligator once. Okay. I guess you didn't like it, huh? I've never had it before. Okay. 
Oh, that's right. Yeah, he did say that. Mentor lawyer rented his law office in the past from Denise and um, Brian. Yeah, and he seemed to think they were they were nice, decent people. But was it him or somebody else that said that it didn't seem like um, Brian treated um, Denise and Mike's daughter Ainsley very well? Yeah, somebody said that. Can't remember exactly. Yeah. Fancy and mentor the original gangster. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you for being here. And also, um, it's always great to have other people addicted to the case joining in on the live streams too. Yeah, thanks for enjoying the dress. <laughs> Officially called Lumpy Face, <laughs> yeah. Charlie looks so bad, I want to see Wendy with an extra 150 pounds in orange. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that would be interesting. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay, so you think Carl may be interested in self-promotion? Well, I mean, a lot of people who do YouTube channels, they're trying to sell something or sell their consulting services or sell their coaching or books or, you know, like there was this guy, um, now I'm drawing a blank as to I think he's a chiropractor in Virginia or something. So he used to have all these really nice videos about eating right and nutrition and um, foods to avoid and stuff. But then I did some more sleuthing on him and um, it seems like he's kind of nutty and he's always trying to sell his supplements and vitamins and stuff. So I was really turned off about that and unsubscribed from, plus he's a chiropractor. He's not a real doctor, but I think he tries to sell himself as a doctor. But anyway, I'm getting off topic here. Okay, I think it was tried in that same courtroom as Katie McBen, same judge. Yeah, it was definitely the same judge, Judge Hankinson. Yeah. I have to say, I would love to see Wendy like that also. Remember that about McBen, her 15 minutes of fame is up. Yeah. True lifestyles. Katie said, you should know better <laughs> to the child guard when a roommate was to be placed with her. Yeah. <laughs> L -O -L -S. Yeah. Yeah, Katie's so full of herself. Carl stated after his brother's channel introduced him to this case, brainwashing children, Carl was a great asset to helping. He hadn't heard of it before, John. Uh, remember cell block H, anyone? It was an English female prison drama where they called the female guards, you bloody screws. Oh, okay, I've never heard of that. <laughs> yeah, I don't really watch any English shows, but that sounds interesting. Um, the taped evidence of Mike's first wife with Denise was good too. Oh, did Mike have a first wife? Oh, okay. Yeah, interesting. Okay, because I guess I didn't know about that. Okay, I just realized that video of mentor. Yeah, the one where I think it's titled Wendy with a question mark and he has like fake blue contacts or did something to change his eyes to blue. Um, I disagree, not a slam dunk. Good witness in Jeff. Wendy had major advantage from Dan's death. Yeah, exactly. The main thing, getting relocation. You know, remember that was supposed to be her non-negotiable. So she finally got to up and leave within days after Dan was shot. Yeah. Just wear aqua on glasses, <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, uh, Willie Meggs is so old now, he must be like one of the turkeys on his turkey farm, just saying. He has a lot to answer for. Also, Ruth is so classy with Dennis Murphy the other night. Wow, I was impressed how conversant he was with Joel. Yeah, Joel is a really good interviewer. When alligator eat an alligator. Oh, that would be so gross. Yeah. Uh, Miss Cheryl is beloved. First happened, it wasn't going to be investigated right away or they were trying not to do anything. I'm not good with the name. So whoever they knew growing up there then wasn't going to prosecute. Oh, yeah, so awful. I mean, so many years passed. I mean, good thing Cheryl was still alive and well. Oh, okay, hi, Sunny. Thanks for being here. Yeah, blue with blue contacts. Oh, yeah, Dr. Burke. Yeah, that's right. He's not an MD. He's a chiropractor. Um, I ate crocodile tacos. Okay. Um, presumably Charlie Adelson won't toss <coughs> Donna Harvey or Wendy. Donna will protect under the bus for a deal. What does Charlie have to offer to Kaplan? Probably nothing. Yeah, I don't think he has anything to offer. He's just going to 
fight it all the way through his attorney Rashbaum. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank you, Maui Swift. Uh, Dr. Berg is also a Scientologist. His son. Yeah, I, I saw the video where his son was criticizing him as to how he laughs, how much money he makes on supplements. He is a chiropractor, not a medical. That's right. Yeah. So don't believe everything you see on YouTube. <laughs> yeah. um, Carl has provided excellent commentary. He has a fine legal mind. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah. So Harold says he meant Brian Winchester's first wife. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Okay, yeah, the, the wife who looked all mousy on the stand, Kathy, yeah. But um, from what I recall reading, they were all like swingers and um, you know, doing spousal, spouse swapping or whatever. Uh, okay, my chiropractor tried to sell me massages, heat therapy, magnesium pills, blood tests in the kitchen sink. Oh, yeah, they got to make a buck, right? Yeah. Tim Jansen is great. He's going to remember every detail on the case. And so it's really hard to be an actual practicing attorney and remember all the facts. Just like with um, Louis Rivera's former attorney, you know, I mean, he clearly had forgotten facts about the Markel case. I mean, that's the last thing on his mind these days, six and a half years later. So that was um, Chuck Collins. <coughs> He actually emailed me recently and said he'd ha be happy to come back on a show. So I'm like, really? Okay. <laughs> because it was hard to schedule him. And, um, you know, I don't know. So maybe I should take Chuck Collins up on his offer and say, hey, want to come back on a live stream and we'll just throw questions at you. Although he, he just really hasn't been following the Markel case, though. It was just yet another court-appointed client to him. And he did a great job. And then it was over within two and a half months with Luis Rivera. So um, I do have a prosecutor, my prosecutor friend from college, Cyril Yu, has been on at least a couple of live streams in the past. So he's been reading up on the Markel Adelson case. I sent him over a ton of stuff and hopefully we'll be able to schedule him in to come back and give us his opinions. And he is an actively, you know, working attorney who works for the, um, works for the DA's office down in Los Angeles. So, okay, okay, so you eat <laughs> alligators. <laughs> okay, what is it that interests you so in this case? Well, um, I, I've mentioned it on multiple occasions, but what really drew me into the case when I first heard about it was because just like Wendy, I was also the spouse of a tenure track law professor who had to move because of the spouse's job. And I was always kind of annoyed and bitter and resentful to some degree because I felt like my legal career kind of went down the gutter when I had to move from DC to North Carolina. And so, um, you know, I ended up getting separated and getting divorced the same years as Dan and Wendy did. And we also had a child the same year that Dan and Wendy had their first child. And, um, but I never thought about you know, killing off my former spouse, <laughs> you know, I mean, that, it, it just never occurred to me, but it, it just drew me into the case feeling like I could identify with Dan and Wendy so much. And, you know, I mean, back when I was a faculty spouse, I, I did get to know a lot of the other law professors and their spouses and get together and stuff. And um, it also turns out that I do know some people who, who were friends with Dan or um, maybe I'm like one or two degrees of separation to Dan Markell. Um, so th those are those are the main reasons why I got kind of sucked into the case. And I read a lot of the stuff that David Latt wrote a long time ago on Above the Law. And that's why um, for the longest time, you know, I, I didn't think Wendy had anything to do with Dan's murder either. Um, it, would, it was just something that I was always just interested in, but it wasn't until about a year and a half ago when I happened to ask um, Stephen Epstein if he wanted to be a guest on a live stream show to talk about um, his books and stuff. Um, then he just mentioned to me that he was working on a book at that time about the Dan Markell murder. And I was like, wow, you know, I didn't think anybody around here even knew about the case or even cared about the case. 
So it was just really cool to find somebody else who is also a local attorney here in North Carolina who was delving into the case and he let me read a draft of his book and I, you know, helped give my input and stuff like that. But so anyway, that's when I realized that people were actually watching the video of my interview with Steve so much. And I was like, well, then maybe I should cover the Dan Markell case because it's something that I had sort of been following, I mean, not obsessively um, since 2014, but I had been reading up on it and stuff. So I started um, doing more of a deep dive into it. Somebody told me about Mentor Lawyers. So I searched for him on YouTube and started watching Mentor Lawyers videos as well as Fancy Fictions videos. So it's just been really cool to have access thanks to the internet and YouTube sleuths um, to find out even more and more details about this case. Because otherwise, if we didn't have YouTube, if we didn't have people like Mentor Lawyer and True Lifestyles and Fancy Fiction, um, you know, really providing a lot more information behind the scenes stuff and these wiretaps and stuff, then a lot of people really wouldn't know much or, or think that, oh, you know, Wendy had nothing to do with it. You know, let's all feel sorry for her. You know, it, it's um, it's a very complex case. And I identify with the people um, just based on my own background, you know, coming from a family, you know, where my dad was also a doctor and we lived um, in Georgia, not too far from the border with Florida. We went to Florida a lot. So, so there's a lot of reasons why I was drawn to the case and started covering it a lot more on this channel in the last, um, I would say the last year. Okay, so I guess that's in a nutshell. <laughs> so, yeah, Carl's great. You give massages for free. Okay, interesting. When will Remy Oliver will be back? Yeah, well, people have asked like, like, where's Tony? And when will Remy be back? Or will Bruce come back? You know, so it just depends. It's like, if, if people want to be on my show, please reach out to me. I need more guests. I need to figure out what we're going to do for the next um, seven months before Charlie's trial takes place. <laughs> so, um, I mean, there are some other cases that sort of interest me also. So I'll probably cover some other cases. So as soon as we have something to read or something else to talk about or whatever, you know, I'll be glad to have um, Remy and Tony and um, Bruce has said he would love to be back too. It seems like people really were watching the live stream shows where Bruce and I were just kicking back and talking about the case. Yeah, and hopefully Fancy will join in too. So um, all Katie has to offer is how she diverted the money from the Adelsons to Tara Kawas and Christopher DeCoz. Yeah, that would be interesting to find out too. Yeah, who was really funding her attorneys? Yeah, and I, I still, you know, I've mentioned this before also, but I feel that if Katie had actually had a court, of, court appointed attorney, just like Louis Rivera did, she probably would have cut a deal. So there's always that kind of you know, that dynamic between attorneys and their clients where the attorney, you know, sure, they want to help their client also, but attorneys also have to make a living. And so court appointed attorneys, as Chuck Collins said, he he only got paid twenty five thousand dollars a flat fee to represent Louis Rivera, whereas, you know, a privately retained attorney might be charging hundreds of thousands of dollars you know, if not millions, depending on how rich the client is to defend somebody. So there is that kind of conflict where the attorney wants to make money versus, you know, do you want your client to get as good of a deal as as they can possibly get? So, so in a way, this is just my opinion. I feel like Luis Rivera actually was better served because he had a court appointed attorney who probably, um, saw the evidence against Lewis and told him, you can be the first to sing and you'll get the best deal. And Lewis believed his court appointed attorney and cut a deal. And so uh, total, he will serve 19 years out of which 12 was ready for some unrelated, unrelated drug offense. So anyway, just some more commentary there. Yeah, Remy is my boy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Remy's a great sport. He's always ready to pitch in and help help do readings and stuff. People like him. Um, Chuck was great on sh your show. Yeah, I mean, I was really happy that he agreed to talk with me because I had no connection to him. I just found his email online and, and contacted him. 
So, and he's very busy because he's in court all the time. So, and trials, yeah. Um, hi, John. Hi, Skeeter Girl. Will Tim Jansen or John Singer come on your show? Well, I guess I could ask them. I haven't asked them yet. Yeah, and I, I don't have Tim's email, but I do have John's email from back when we were guests together on Surviving the Survivor a while back. Yeah, so definitely I'll be reaching out. I mean, this is just more stuff that I have to do in addition to actually trying to run a law practice. But but I'm always trying to like think of other ideas and try to get other guests. And of course, some people just wind up kind of giving you a runaround and stuff. <laughs> so it's hard getting guests or, or people who are willing and able to, because I did have a, a quasi relative of mine uh, my cousin's brother-in-law went to Cornell with Daniel Rashbaum, and he's an attorney. He, he loves talking. He has a lot to say. He has a lot of talents and stuff. But the problem is, is that he had to run it by his employer. So the employer, you know, does not let their attorneys, you know, go on YouTube shows or talk in public uh, or anything. So, so that kind of stunk because I was really getting excited to have this, um, this person who was willing to come on the show and, talk about stuff and talk about his legal career and stuff, but he was not allowed to do so. Yeah, um, that would be a good interview to prosecute. Yeah, I, I am kind of surprised that Cyril was able to like get on YouTube and, and talk about stuff and talk about his his legal work. But, um, you know, that's good for us, right? When people are willing to get on and be seen. Yeah, that's right. That's what he said. He just made $25,000 for the Rivera matter and that was all he would have been paid if he had gone all the way through trial. I'm curious to see how Charlie's trial will go. People will testify. Oh yeah, there's probably like a huge list of witnesses that are going to be testifying in Charlie's trial. Um, let's see, okay, people are saying hi to Skeeter. Imagine that, separate rather than murder. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's why it, it, it's always mind boggling still to see all these heinous crimes that are being committed left and right. It's like, wow, people thought they could get away with that. Yeah, I wish he would come back. Okay, are you talking about Chuck? Chuck Collins, the attorney? Okay, uh, thank you, Skeeter. Hope you're enjoying having your new grandson. Uh, me too, John. Wonder if all his ex-friends have something to add. Oh, yeah, totally. Yeah, I, I bet that former roommate has a lot more to add now that they had it falling out. I just can't believe they got to delay this case for seven months. That's unbelievable. It's so unfair to the Markel family. Yeah, so that wasn't a surprise, though, because it was the first time he had asked to delay the trial. But um you know, but the good thing is at least we won't all have to be in Tallahassee during the heat, <laughs> the horrible heat of the summer. So the weather should be good at the very end of October. Bunch of dudes set the narrative on Wendy because they found her police interview authentic, sad. Yeah, I mean, I mean, well, I, I had seen some parts of the police interview a long time ago or somewhere, I can't even remember, but you know, I just, my takeaway was that, oh, you know, her family did this without her knowing, but it's not until you really do the deep dive, the sleuthing, listening to all the, you know, all those wiretaps that you have graciously put on YouTube for us, the general public to hear, and, you know, reading transcripts, seeing the trial testimony, everything together. Yeah, it, it really changes the, changes the picture. Um, I also came to see, okay. Uh, okay, not me. Glad you did get interested, Judy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's a, such an interesting case and you just feel this like big pool of, the pool of the case, like we can't let them get away with it. Just as Georgia said, don't let them get away with it the way they thought they could get away with it. So yeah, due to June <laughs> impression, I can have lots of, yeah. Well, you know, th th this sounds really funny, but actually, you know, when I'm driving in the car and stuff, sometimes I do fall into my June voice, but I do have something kind of funny in store, uh, which incorporates an, a June impression but um, I don't know. I mean, do you guys think that would be mean to keep in, impersonating June when she is innocent in this? She's just happened to have dated Charlie and wound up having some information pertinent to the murder. So 
I don't know. You guys let me know if you really think I should do some sort of June impersonation again, or should I back off? And I don't want to make her mad if she ever sees it. And then would it affect the way she testifies? I don't know. Um, I was relieved to hear Singer and Jansen's new views on Wendy's interrogation. They did a 180 turn. Yeah, maybe they've been reading all the YouTuber comments and the commentary and stuff. So, so good, good for them. Yeah. Uh, See, yeah, good on you, Harold. How evil Wendy has an ally in the world is galling. Yeah, and there, um, thanks to Fancy Fiction, you know, on Patreon, you can see a picture of her with her boyfriend. So, or should we say man friend? Yeah, he, he definitely looks older than she is, and he's bald. Um, not that there's anything wrong with that, right? But um, so... So yeah, so Wendy seems to be outwardly still enjoying life and has had a new boyfriend recently. I don't know how recent that picture was. Um, hey, Jerry Trout Mentor, thank you for being here. Hey, we were just talking about you. <laughs> so I have to be nice to everybody. Um, yeah, thank you, Carl. Really appreciate your, your commentary on the case. Um, technically not one year in prison that's being served for Mike's murder, Brian had immunity for his testimony and Denise is serving for conspiracy, not murder. Yeah, uh, just, just a horrible case, especially since they had all been friends since they were kids. You know, you saw, or at least in Epstein's book and stuff, he had these like pictures of them together, like prom or high school or whatever. So uh, I unsubscribed from Dr. Berg's channel too once I discovered he's a chiropractor and Scientologist. Okay, people are saying hi to Carl. Yeah, please subscribe to Jury Trial Mentor. And of course, I bet everybody here is subscribed also to Fancy Fiction and Don DeCusto's uh, channels. Every day I look for videos from Judy Fancy and Mentor. Yeah, I mean, I do have that compulsion. Like even if it's in the middle of the day, if I get this like notification on my cell phone, it's like, oh, you know, next time I have a spare moment, I got to like click on this and, and see what Fancy has released or what Mentor Lawyer has released or STS or um, now, now Carl's channel and Dawn. Yeah, so many people that are just looking for justice for for Dan. They didn't want to get Epstein. Okay, um, okay. Carl was not mes mesmerized by Wendy, so I like him. Yeah, good going, Carl. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. People are behind you all the way. Yeah, don't be mesmerized. Yeah. Mentor lawyer videos of Acosta's interrogation is enough to use against trying. Yeah, but they can't just flash up his interrogation. He he has to be there to testify um, against Charlie. Yeah, just like a procedural thing. Um, okay. Mentor lawyer, fancy fiction, true lifestyles, and you, Judy, are doing a fantastic job covering the case. Yeah, we do what we can, but it's not like I don't really have any insider information, but I've just been helped by some people behind the scenes who would send me things through email, you know, like some of the legal things. Um, so that's that's really helpful. Epstein did that to himself. I always enjoy June's testimony. Which bag will she bring? What will she wear? How transparent will her lies be this time? LOL, good stuff, yeah. Uh, as in Steve Epstein, <laughs> okay. Yeah, because uh, yeah, Epstein has a different meaning to those of us who are in the Dan Markell uh, community, right? Yeah. Um, let's see, Tim and John agreed Wendy will not get acquitted, so charges expected. Yeah, I mean, we, we sure hope so. I mean, what's taking them so long? You know, are they gonna wait until right before Charlie's trial to, to make at least arrest Donna, please? Yeah. Uh, Wendy is not looking so high. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to be snarky, but yeah, that photo of her with the man friend, you know, I mean, looks like she's been getting some good eating. Okay, I Epstein all over again, if, if given the chance. Okay. Uh, Epstein, Epstein himself, like Meg Ben. <laughs> okay, yeah, so we're coming up with new terms, right? Like insider. We're speaking in code now. Okay, Epstein, Epstein himself, y'all. <laughs> um, another great video, Judy. Unfortunately, I have to bounce. Okay, thank you for being here, Ollie, and everybody else who's still watching. Uh, jury trial mentor, from your lips to God's ears. 
I can't change people's behavior, but have the right to react appropriately. And I did. Yes. Um, Katie should be present at Charlie's trial. Yeah, she should. I think so. I mean, I'd be surprised if she doesn't testify, but who knows, you know? Yeah, it's hard, hard to predict. Uh, Katie was done like a dinner, peace and love. I'm a pacifist at heart. Yeah, you are very polite to a lot of these like rude people who come onto your live stream or leave rude comments on your, your channel. I mean, you're nicer than I am when you respond to them. Um, hey, Carl, love your input. Hope charges are sooner rather than later. Yes. Uh, Rivera deal, similar to Winchester's. Yeah. Uh, fancy, I'd wager that his book isn't doing that well. Jury trial mentor, are you setting up a merch store? I want to buy LJ a coffee. <laughs> Hope you're well. Okay. Tara Kawas won an award in Florida. Look on her website regarding her excellent defense of Kay Katie McDaniel. Ah, Tara Kawas guaranteed her client life without parole plus 30 plus 30. High five to Tara. Yeah. <coughs> Wasn't that award before the second trial though? Yeah. <coughs> Sorry. But okay. I probably have to get going soon. Um, okay. She lost spectacularly. Spot on. Okay. Art E, that award, the same regional professional group is awarding the same that same award, the public defenders who defended Nicholas Cruz, who were <coughs> widely criticized by many for bad behavior <coughs> because Miami. Oh. Well, yeah, so like I said, I'm I'm glad I did not wind up being a criminal defense attorney because I don't think I would have lasted long. Um, but I had thought about uh, working for different public defenders as well as DA's offices right after graduation. A uh, big party in Tallahassee that day Charlie is convicted. I'm there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, but we can't predict like what day that will be because we don't know when the trial is going to end and, you know, when the how, how long it's going to take the jury to deliberate and stuff. I would love to be there, but I can't just hang out in Tallahassee for two weeks, though, unfortunately. Yeah, the heat in Tallahassee that causes down trees with police presence and crime scene tape. Yeah, I thought it was a down tree, but an electrical storm. Electrical storm? What? Okay, would love to hear David Latt comment now. Oh, well, David Latt, actually, um, he was on one of those Surviving the Survivor shows when John Singer and I were on it months ago. This was a long time ago before Surviving the Survivor totally blew up. Yeah, so you can hear David's commentary, and he now believes that um, that Wendy was involved with Dan's murder. So he did publicly say that. I think all public defenders and defense lawyers are necessary, but there is a line. There has to be a line. If it gets crossed, that's bad not to be rewarded. Yeah, but but that's how they make their money. So, you know, I think. Yeah, after seeing that Who Killed Robert Wan Peacock documentary, I was so disgusted with Bernie Grimm. So I was kind of happy when I Googled him. Bernie Grimm was the defense attorney for Joseph Price, who is um, one of the main suspects in Robert Wan's murder. So I was like, yeah, Bernie just seems so despicable and stuff, but he's actually been disbarred. Um, so I think years and years of just doing criminal defense, you know, how can that not change somebody's personality? you know, or their sense of wrong and right, or their rationality, I think. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, clearly, you know, you can't paint all defense lawyers with the same brush. You know, I've worked for criminal defense lawyers in the past, so I don't want to say anything totally bad in case, lo and behold, somebody's actually watching my YouTube channel. But, um, but you're right, you know, like, they get rewarded by getting people off from heinous crimes. And, they get paid money to do it and the better they are the more money they can make so um so that i think it does kind of change people after a while I'm so glad not to be um, a public defender but it is a really tough job it doesn't pay well either um have david ladd on your show i got a lot of questions for him oh well actually um i don't think he watches my channel but i did ask him a while back if he would like to be a guest on the show and he just kind of brushed it off because he's too busy so 
Um, anyway, so there's stuff going on behind the scenes where I am trying to work hard to get stuff or get people, but um, some people don't want to be on or they can't can't be on. They're too busy. So, uh, yeah, those felonious illogical stars. That's right. Harputlian went over the line. Okay, treacherous trees. Okay, hi, Frankie Figs. Thanks for joining in. We're about ready to wrap up. So I um, hope Katie someday explains exactly why she never felt she could beat her case. Hmm. Yeah. Well, probably because she had been like browbeaten by Charlie or indoctrinated by Charlie. Um, uh, less conditioner in the hair, Wendy. You'll have the windy dry hair. <laughs> Look down back. Okay. Um, Okay, put your tardy slip in the basket. Okay, people are saying hi to Carl. Get it together, Frankie Frank Figs. Just kidding. We're glad you're here. They were realistic that Wendy is shrewd and devious and could be a difficult witness as she is smart, hopefully too smart for her own good. Yeah, but there was a lot of like snappy comebacks that Georgia was able to make to Wendy when she was trying to lie or twist the facts about things. Don't know, when Wesley, it seems Wendy was gifted with extra hair. <laughs> oh, okay. Judy, my sides are finally healed from your last June impression. Bring it on. <laughs> okay. Well, see, but that's the problem. Like, she's still going to be a witness in an upcoming trial. So, you know, I don't know if she or her friends or relatives have seen my video or felt really hurt or offended or something but I definitely do not want to interfere with the administration of justice by making a potential witness really mad and maybe affecting the way she testified. I don't know, but I would hope that the way it might affect her is that it would make her testify more honestly and be more forthcoming because if she knows that people are laughing at her and disgusted with her because of the way she testified in the previous trials where she's like backpedaling like crazy about what she had previously said and acting like she's protecting Adelson's, then that's that's a good effect. You know, we want her to tell the truth and to be forthcoming because if she tries to, you know, protect the Adelson's and change her story or lie again, then, you know, public perception is going to be very negative toward her. So anyway, yeah, so it's just kind of me talking out loud. Um, uh, okay, so hi, everybody, lovers of justice. Uh, there is really a hell of a justice for Dan Markell ecosystem. Very cool. Yeah. And so, so you know, it, I'm very grateful for everybody for trying to bring out the truth and, um, you know, keeping the di dialogue going. Okay. Uh, she hasn't gifted much. Okay, love my justice for Dan family, art family. John had Ruth Markell on his channel. Yeah, okay, well, I can't wait to see that. Yeah, that, that's going to be amazing. So just her composure and her sense of dignity, you know, it's, it's just really remarkable, especially given how, how cruel and mean it, it seems that Wendy and Donna and Harvey have treated her since Dan died. You know, like how can she just keep, biting her tongue and try to be tactful whenever people try to ask her about Wendy and the Adelsons. You know, she, she has a tremendous amount of tact. So the idea that anyone could believe that Wendy had no prior knowledge is a joke. Epstein did it to himself. Have Carl, well, you know, to his credit, I don't know if you guys saw that follow-up interview that he did with Surviving the Survivor, but I, I think he did kind of you know, try to redeem himself in that interview by saying, you know, he, he wasn't sure he something, something to that effect, but um, feel free to watch that interview on surviving that survivor. If you guys feel like it, yeah. Have Carl and John on your show. Good vibes. Yeah. Okay. Well, John has said that he's too busy to be on the live stream show, but we'll see if Carl has time. So yeah. Uh, let's see, as I walk in from work every evening, I say to myself, did Donna and Wendy get arrested yet? Just waiting. Yeah. I mean, there's just like a lot of things that remind me about the case also mm -hmm. throughout the day. And then it's like, oh, you know, now I'm thinking about that Markel case again. Yeah. Okay. Do you think Sigfredo and Wendy hooked up? 
uh, that's what I, I think. I think they know each other, but that's mainly based on the uh, Louis Rivera mentioning Wendy repeatedly in his police interview when he was making a proffer and saying that Sigfredo referred to Wendy as his homie and Sigfredo seemed to know Wendy. Um, so it could have been that Wendy did directly speak with Sigfredo and had talked with him. Uh, when does Louis Rivera do for parole? Well, hmm. Good question. Let me think about that. So he had been in prison since 2016. So 19 plus 16, 35, 2035. So he's supposed to be out in 2035. Yeah, I, I think so. So um, yeah, time is just passing on by. Uh, he thought he was winning Katie over plus patting his wallet. Oh, okay. Thank you, Tony, for being here also. Uh, you'll have champagne, big party on sentencing day. June is a celebrity, not popular with the ladies, though. That's why they like equal men and women on the jury. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, she does have really good information to say, but, you know, I just want her to stop being so wishy-washy. She, she doesn't really want it to hurt the Adelsons and, you know, just even claiming that that stapler remark was something that um, that the police brought up, or there was something about that where she was trying to act like she didn't really say that remark about Charlie stapling money. But when you go back and listen to the police interview or read the transcript, it is obvious. June brought it up herself. She wasn't prompted to, she wasn't given, she wasn't given that information by the police at all. She just came out and started saying, like another thing I noticed was that, um, you know, he would always staple his money and who staples cash? I mean, use a use a paper clip or something, <laughs> you know. So anyway, so that's that's something else I wanted to say about her is that she and she tried to make herself seem like a victim, like, oh, you know, I didn't know that I was being recorded, you know, like what? So you're gonna lie now on the stand as opposed to what you said back in 2018? You know, was that a lie then or what? So anyway. So Lane is excited. You drive down from Kentucky. Okay, you want to meet everybody. The Cruz defense attorney who flipped on the judge. Oh, okay. I didn't know about that. Thank you, Sunny M. I appreciate all your support. Yeah, it would be fun to meet everybody. We're focusing on June staple money memory abilities. <laughs> yeah. Um, 2020 for Kawas Award from Florida Criminal Bar Award title Against All Odds. It's awarded to an attorney who represents an unpopular client or a very difficult case. Yeah. Well, I mean, I guess at that point they were totally cheering because they got the mistrial or the hung jury for Katie back in 2019. So I guess that was something that the defense bar really wanted to separate. Yeah. Yeah, Wendy could have stapled that. Yeah, I guess so. So far, nobody has talked about it, though, but multiple people have talked about Charlie's habit of stapling the money. Yeah. The Cruz team were blatantly disrespectful to the court and the victim's family. Oh, okay. Um, thank you, Esther. I really appreciate it. Um, didn't the jury say they thought Wendy was sus? Yeah, I, I remember reading that somewhere that at least a couple of the members of the jury were wondering if they were wondering well, how come she hasn't been arrested? Why isn't she in jail? So. Okay. Uh, let's see, the June impression. <laughs> Haha, <laughs> I still have a side stitch from Judy's last June impression, but it's so worth it bringing on. I don't care if I break over it. Okay. Well, it might not be as funny if you it's not the first time you see it anymore. Can we see you in a blonde wig to match them? Yeah. Well, you know, wigs cost something. So <laughs> yeah, my YouTube earnings do not really um justify certain expenditures you know, such as wigs or blue contacts or or say like getting the official court live stream feed. So, um, but thanks for ideas. Okay, it might hurt hurt feelings, but I doubt it. Okay. Uh, off topic, can you have one of you connected buddies in GB pull some strings and mix the, okay, are you talking about football? Okay. Um, Okay, so I don't know if Carl is still here, but um, people were discussing you. Okay, 
Uh, okay. Okay, so please support Dawn's channel. She talks about football in addition to the Markel case. Uh, Brown got the better deal. Oh, Brian. Yeah, Brian got the better deal because he showed them where the body was. He had a very valuable piece of info to leverage. Yeah, that's right. Okay. The award was not the Florida Criminal Bar. It's a chapter of the Associate Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. It's a professional association. Okay, thank you. Um, Okay, so Skeeter Girl, your hubby bought you that same LV bag. <laughs> You're like sisters. Oh, okay. Don't you think we look alike? We could be sisters. Oh, let's see. If it could be prove, proven that Wendy stapled the money packs, she'd be guilty. Not likely Wendy did that, though. Don, he warned me there would not be matching luggage following. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay, I don't think there'll be any additional arrests until they see if they have enough to convict Charlie. There is most evidence against him. Yeah, well, yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, I always thought that Donna would have been arrested by now. Yeah. Lewis has three years left in federal, then he goes to state prison. Thank you, Angela. Uh, let's see. Let's all chip in to buy June a new Vuitton bag so she tells the truth. She, she, okay, and you also have Prada. That's nice. Okay, um, let's see. Let's try to wind this up here. Thank you, Fancy Fiction. June's testimony at the first trial was disappointing. It was clear she was willing to lie until confronted by Georgia with a transcript. I mean, Charlie called her the night before per her, yeah, per her testimony. Yep, yep. Um, Okay, getting back to the Williams case, Cheryl knew Mike wasn't eaten by alligators because they don't eat in the winter. He was went missing in December. Oh, okay. Hate when wrong info gets read on the screen. Okay, thank you, Fancy. Okay. Oh, okay, and build up the props on petty cash. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. I mean, I just have have my priorities, right? <laughs> you know, yeah, because somebody else told me I should be buying one of those like fro wigs so I can look like Charlie, <coughs> look like Charlie in his arrest mugshot. I'm like, do I really want to spend 20 or $30 on some wig I'm never going to wear again unless I want to keep showing up on live streams looking like Charlie? I'm going to get an orange sweatshirt or hoodie too, right? Okay. Oh, Carl is back. Okay, Carl. <laughs> okay, Carl, let me know if you would like to be on a live stream show. I would love to talk to you live also. Yeah, thank you, Carl, for all your hard work. Yeah, I know that video, <coughs> that video has gotten tons of hits now, and it must have taken you forever to put it together. It's really hard to edit those types of videos, especially with text showing up on the screen. Um, oh, okay, there's an app. <coughs> okay. Uh, Clown Wig will do. YouTube is misinformation central. Charlie's mugshot hair gave you life. <laughs> um, obsessed with his mugshot, obsessed. Okay. Okay. Well, why don't we call it a day because, oh my gosh, it's been almost two hours. I thought this would be a one hour live stream. So I do have some family obligations to take care of. I um, really appreciate everybody. And thanks to those people who did those, um, what do they call them? Super chats or stickers or something. Um, let's see. Okay. June was fully prepared to perjure herself. She didn't realize how impeachment worked and how well prepared Georgia was for that instance. Yeah. Yeah. Really great job by the prosecutors. Um, okay, yeah, so thank you guys all for joining in. 
and I'll see if Char, if not Charlie, Carl, why did I say Charlie? Um, we'll see if Carl is willing to be on a future live stream show. I'll also ask John Singer and Tim Jansen, and I would like to get some women on the show. You know, it's always been harder to get women to be guests. I think people are more concerned about privacy or just feeling more shy about showing themselves on the screen or whatever. So anybody interested in coming on the show to discuss legal topics. It doesn't have to be the Markel case. It could be some other case that you really want to be on. Um, you know, hopefully we can continue to do these weekly live streams <coughs> uh, before Charlie's trial and come up with other topics. Uh, Cheryl was smart. Yes, I remember reading about that. Um, okay, thank you guys for being here. Hope you enjoy the rest of the weekend. And um, I'm not going to live stream next weekend because it's the World Figure Skating Championships. So, um, oh, great. Thank you, Fancy. Okay, I will definitely reach out to you. So maybe in a couple of weeks, a couple of weeks, um, maybe Fancy Fiction and I can have a super duper live stream together. And then, like I said, Bruce is willing to come on. My friend Cyril Yu, who is the active practicing prosecutor um, in Los Angeles, he's willing to come on. Um, I might have given him way too many things to read, though, so I don't know if he feels prepared yet. Um, okay, awesome. Okay, thank you guys for your enthusiasm and everything. So we'll definitely be in touch, guys. Um, have a really good weekend, and I'll see you next time. Take care. Thank you.